I'm so excited to be with you today because what you have felt so far is what I'm, our, what I'm aligned with as well. And I want you to notice this, is that since you've been here, you've felt certain emotions, you've had thoughts, you've had creative thoughts, you felt inspired, and I love using that word, and I think Jen used that word a couple times, uh, the, root, the root of inspired, or the, the root definition of the word inspired means God's breath. And so what you felt today was inspiring. And why you felt it is because that energy that Jen brought, you breathed in. And you felt it come in you, and then you felt it trying to escape, and it tried to escape through ideas and thoughts and feelings that you've had. What I want you to do in a moment is to answer this question. What are the top three emotions I've felt since I've been here? Write that down. What are the top three emotions you've felt since you've been here? And of all of the things that you've thought of today, because you've thought of a lot of things, you've written down a lot of I am statements, write down that what is the most important thing that you've learned so far today? What's the most important thing? Just write that down. And then I want you to write down a date. When was the last time you felt like you felt today? When was the last time you felt like that? Just pick a day. Was it a couple months ago? And don't worry about the, if, it was, if the date's correct, but just to identify. When was the last time that you felt like you felt today? And then I want you to write down one more date. When is the next time you're going to feel like you felt today? When is the next time you're going to do it? And just by a show of hands, how many of you want to feel in the future like you felt today at a high level? Because what you felt today was that divine power that is inside of you. It, it started to come out. And the reason why you were so connected to it is because your mind was settled and it wasn't in control. Your, your eyes and your brain, your eyes can take in 11 million bits of information per second. Your conscious mind can only process 120 bits of information per second. Your eyes take in 11 million. Your conscious mind can only take in or can only process 120 bits. Your subconscious mind, what Jen said, your subconscious mind can process 20 million bits of information per second. Your subconscious mind. So we're going from 120 bits to 20 million bits per second. Right? Now, you felt this today, and oftentimes in our lives, we don't feel this feeling today that we felt because we're not committed to the things that create what you felt today. Think about it. Jen talked about brushing your teeth. At some point in your life, you did not want to brush your teeth. You were not committed to it. <laughs> it was hell. You're like, why do I got to stick this thing in my mouth with this awful tasting stuff that doesn't taste like a candy bar or a sucker? And then I got to move it back and forth. And you hated it. And your mom, probably your mom, was more committed to you brushing your teeth than you were. And how did that feel? How did it feel? Did it feel great? No kid loves it. It's because her commitment superseded yours. But is it good for you? Are you glad you did it? Why? 
Why are you glad? Because today you're benefiting from the activity of brushing your teeth, although you didn't want to. You're glad for it because you're glad that your mom was more committed and had commitment to you doing that. Oftentimes, the things that we sit in a, in a meeting like we do today, we write down I am statements, we write down all the stuff, and we feel really good. But we're not committed to that feeling that can support those decisions that you've made today. And if you're not committed to the daily activities that don't, that, that support, that do support what you've written down today, you've wasted your time. And so, in reality, what stands between you and what you have written down today is just commitment. It's not ability. It's not ability. Um, I came across this author recently. His name is Orson Sweat Martin. And I don't have his quote. That I, I didn't give her the, his quote. But here's what he said. I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, our creator would never mock us by allowing us to have dreams, aspirations, and desires unto which we have no ability to achieve. He said that our dreams and our desires are actually prophecies indications and forerunners of the obtainable reality and what stands in the way of us obtaining all of those things because we have this great creative power within us is our is one action and that is to hold in our mind a persistent thought that we can become that which we were born to be and we can do that which we were born to do and so what Jan just taught over the last couple hours is probably the most important thing you'll ever learn in your life. Because it activates that creative power. And no way would you be created or be given an opportunity or, the, the, or be created and have the ability to conceive things that you legitimately cannot do. Where's the slide? There we go. All right. Skip. <laughs> and what usually stands in the way of us actually doing what we want to do is that we have this thought that we have to have all the answers. And it's just not true. You're never going to have all the answers. When you think about this, this morning when you got up, you had to get dressed. Hopefully you brushed your teeth. You had to get in your car, start it up, and drive here. You did not have all the answers of how, and how everything was going to play out to the point that you got here. You were just committed to get here. You woke up and you thought, what am I going to wear today? Am I actually going to wash my hair today or is today the day I don't wash my hair? Right? I just learned that, that, I, cannot, that I can also not wash my hair and get away with it. So, and it speeds it up. It's pretty good. I'm just dumb enough not to figure this out until I was 46. But you didn't have all the answers of what, everything that was going to happen today. And neither will you with any aspiration that you write down. You never will. And yet our mind, when it's not quiet, tells us you have to know everything in order to do it. So don't start until you know it. And it's not true. Your mind is designed to protect you. That's it. And your heart was created to guide you. And today, you felt what you felt all morning because your heart took over, because you quieted your mind, 
and you allowed your heart to be the primary source of information and not your brain. Carl says, having all the answers is not essential to living. What is essential is the sense of God's presence during your dark seasons. The answers always come exactly when they're supposed to. And it's a privilege of a lifetime to become who you really are. And that's why you came here today, is to actually become who you really are. And why you felt those emotions that you wrote down is because you were in alignment with the path of becoming that. And you found answers because they showed up because you were ready. Do you guys see it? And what brought all of this to you today is one thing, commitment. Without it, you would still be the sorry suckers you were before you started today. <laughs> you really would. You would be the sorry ass person that you woke up to be this morning. And now you've changed because you've written down new statements. How many of you guys follow this? So, William Murray says this, until one is committed, there is hesitancy. The chance to draw back, always in effectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and, created, and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which countless ideas and splendid kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves to. Providence can't move if you don't know what the hell you're doing and what you're committed to. It stands on the sidelines waiting for you to act on your agency and to make a decision and to do the shit. That's why it remains dormant in your life and why stuff doesn't change. Because you're not committed to it. How can the universe be more committed to something in your life than you are? It can't be. It's impossible. It goes against every law that operates this whole planet. And that's why he says, whatever you can do or dream, you can. He says, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. And when you act in a moment where you don't know exactly how to act, that's when providence fills the gaps. And you don't give providence the opportunity to fill the gap when you're not committed. You can look at your, your plan and oftentimes you'll leave this moment, you'll leave this room and you'll go home and here's what happens. If you got kids, it happens at a higher level. All the stuff that you thought and felt, it goes away real quick because they enact your mind and it starts going busy. What do they need? What do they need? What do they need? And you forget what you need and you forget what, how you need to feel yourself. And if you're not putting on the oxygen mask first, your kids are going to die. And that's what happens. I've had to teach this to my wife. I'm like, you're not married to the kids. And they, go, they grow up and leave us. I'm like, we don't care about them right now. They have to go to bed on their own. And I would tell my kids, do not come out of this room unless you're bleeding, choking, or dying. <laughs> and we closed, and I would close the door. And Zoe opened it up one time. She goes, what about throwing up? Yeah. I'm like, bleeding, dying, choking, throwing up. Okay, that's it. Anything beyond that, stay in the damn room or I'm gonna lock the door. So, but you go home and you have kids and you forget because you get so busy, then you think you're doing the right thing because you're helping your kids and you're not. You're not helping your kids 
if you're not putting the oxygen mask on first. Because what you're teaching them is they are more important than you. And that's not true. Because without them, they're lost. Without you, they're lost. And to show your children how to respect who they are is that you have to respect who you are. And you have to make the time to quiet the mind, connect with the heart, and do that which your heart tells you to do. And to find that commitment and to find the space and the time to do it. Because your life is nothing more than the emotions that you experience. And the meaning that you give it. That's all it is. You can buy whatever, go wherever. All you're doing is trying to create an emotion. And all you're doing is trying to create a belief. And until you're committed, you can't have the things that are the most precious things in life. And you can't remain undecided at what you're going to do. You have to walk out of this room decided that you first how can you teach your kids anything if you don't do it first? It's all hypocrisy if you're not living it first. So step into the moment when you go home and there's all the noise and the chaos and find the time and the, or gain the commitment here today and find the time and then feed yourself first. But be committed to what you're doing and don't get lost in the noise of everything that you hear. And there's a, a, a couple, uh, the last two years, I've been listening to a bunch of different stuff or listening to a book or watching this and that. And, and I would get confused as like, I'm, I have all these different sources that I'm listening to. And I realized like, I just, I couldn't decide which source or what am I going to do to actually get what I want. And I remained in this mode of indecision of taking my life to the, to the next level or where, where I wanted to be. And I'm, I just have to remind myself of the story that I'm gonna share with you that I learned um, when I went to Tony Robbins. He shared the story about General Schwarzkopf and it just, it really shifts me every time I find myself indecisive and not committed. And here's the story. The military had spent 10 years being in debate on the uh, security measures that they were going to take to secure America, uh, that what the military was going to do. At the time, General Schwarzkopf, who was uh, a two-star general at the time, he was the guy who led the Gulf War in 91, he was this two-star general, and he brought, and they were sitting in this committee, and, they, and he brought uh, these three binders of the plans that these committees have been t discussing over the last 10 years, eight to 10 years. And he said, we need to come to a decision. Here are the binders. Which one are, you know, your, your job, general, the five-star general, your job is to review all of this, all of these studies, and to determine which course of action is best for the country. And the general grabbed a binder and picked one up and just said, we're going to do that one. And General Schwarzkopf was panicked, and everybody was panicked in the room. And he said, Sir, with all due respect, how could you possibly know what's in that binder? And how could you possibly know how that's going to affect the country? You haven't even reviewed it. And he says, I don't have to. He goes, I'm a leader, and you guys brought me here to make a decision, and I made it, and we're committing to this one. He says, and as we follow this path and we find things that aren't working, we're going to make a shift. But until then, this is the shit we're going to do. And you too have to remain committed to a course of action. And don't second guess yourself at which action that you're, that you're taking. Commit to it, do it, it full hearted because you'll never discover if the action's worthy or not if you do it half hearted. Commit to an action, commit to a path, to a plan, do it full hearted and make adjustments. And take time to quiet your mind 
connect with your heart, and the answers will show up in the exact moment that you need them. Thank you for letting me be with you today. Uh, so while we're micing up, just real quick, um, I had this dream of creating a, a podcast, and one day I woke up and thought, if I were to share a message with my clients, because I had a client that was going through a hard time, I got up early in the morning and I thought, what would I say to them? And I was thinking about the story I'm about to share with you. I was thinking about this experience that I went through. And so I was thinking, like, what would I say? How would I say it? And so uh, I got my phone and I recorded this message. And then I just added music to it on my, with the, uh, the app I have on my phone. I'm going to have Kayla. I can mic that up. Cool. I'm going to have Kayla just play that while I get this up. I just want you to hear it because this is how this line of thinking is how I got through this um, di really difficult time of, in my business a couple years ago. So uh, I'm just going to have her play it. It's like it's about five minutes long. share with you a thought that I've been having, and it's this. Uh, a number of years ago, I watched a documentary on the Wright brothers, and about two weeks before they achieved flight, Wilbur wrote a letter to his father. And in that letter, he described all the adversities that they had been experiencing, and they were uh, almost to the point of giving up. Um, there was an infestation of mosquitoes and they suffered from illness and it was just awful. But in that letter he said something like this, Father, regardless of the adversities and trials that we're experiencing, I would not give in. I'm afraid that it will cost me my life because I know I am here so that man can achieve flight. I got the chills and I, I just thought, what creates that belief? How did he obtain that belief? And how did he continue to believe it with all the adversities that he had been experiencing? And I've held that thought in my mind for a long time and then recently I came across this author and his name is Orson Sweat Martin and he said this the creator never mocked us with yearnings for that which we have no ability or possibility of obtaining that our heart longings and aspirations are prophecies forerunners indications of the existence of the obtainable reality that there is an actual powerful creative force in our legitimate desires and believing with all of our hearts that no matter what the seeming obstacles are we shall be what we were intended to be and do what we were made to do and it just hit me that the Wright brothers believe that and it was undeniable for them. And then I remember reading something from Albert Einstein and he said, everything is energy and that's all there is to it. Match the frequency of the reality you want and you cannot help but get that reality. There can be no other way. This is not a philosophy, this is physics. And so here's my final thought. The adversities that the Wright brothers were experiencing were there to increase their energy, to increase their frequency, so that the reality could be created. I just think it's impossible that they reached a point of nearly turning back and then success happened and fight was achieved. 
but it's the adversities, the obstacles that help us to create the energy so that our reality can be manifested. That's powerful. It's incredible that really the only thing that stands between us and what we want, what our heart longs for, is the ability to persevere the trial so that we can receive the energy to manifest the reality. That's amazing. I wanted you to have that thought. A couple of years ago in my business, we had switched to a new title software. And when the contractor or when the, the, the software company, when they built out our server for what we do, um, the specs they gave us, or yeah, the specs, um, they were consistent for having 10 people off of that server. And what we needed was a server for 100 people. And they gave us the specs for 10. So I hate even talking about this because two people that work with me are here and they experienced this and it was like awful. It was horrific. And so as we implemented this new software, more and more people were getting on to the software every day of my business. Uh, it began to be slower and slower and slower. And when I say this, I'm not exaggerating. Like, it would take 90 seconds to open an email. Like, unreal. I think Leslie's crying right now. Like, it was awful. And what happened is because everybody was under the assumption that the server was built out according, you know, they... 10 times the recipe, uh, nobody looked at the server being the problem. We looked at internet, we looked at software, like maybe the software wasn't integrating. We looked at everything else and it was awful. And I would come into work every day and uh, just, just thinking like, what, what am I going to do because there's nothing to do. This isn't something you can fix. And w even if it was something that we could fix, we couldn't fix it today. You got to order the, the parts. Like, you can't just fix it in a day. Because the, the server that we had was, is, it's pretty sophisticated. Stuff that you had to order from Dell that would take 30 days to get. So, again, we did not know this. So for days we went through this and it was horrific. And People were working 16-hour days on Sunday, on Saturday, because we just couldn't get through the files. You couldn't, you couldn't do your work. And I remember thinking, like, if anything could go wrong, like, this would be the one thing that just cripples everything because it's, it, it's pervasive. And during this time, we had other title companies were trying to recruit our people at a very high level, and it was like awful. It was, I mean, everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And I remember just thinking, every day we had tried to do the same thing and, we, and nothing would work, right? We would, and every day just seemed like Groundhog Day, like that movie, you'd come in, and it was just the same shit every day. I'm like, I don't even know what to say anymore. Like, how long can I say we'll fix this in a week? Like, I, I can't fix it. Nobody, nobody even knows the problem. Uh, our, our title software is, is SoftPro, and they're, like, they're the second largest software provider for title in the world. And I called them up and just said, this has to get fixed. We'll just go back, and, and, and they couldn't figure it out. They sent people out, and they couldn't even figure it out. And I remember I went home on a weekend, on a Friday night, my wife was out of town or something, and I was home with the kids, and I was coming home, and I thought, 
I keep doing everything the same way and nothing has changed for three weeks. And we were, clients were frustrated and we even lost some clients and it was, and there were just, there was no solution. And every day was worse than the previous day. It wasn't getting any better, it was getting worse. And uh, there's a quote a friend told me about, I can't remember who or what it came from. I think it came from like uh, the Cherokee or something like this, but it says, in the end, everything's gonna be okay. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. And I just kept saying that all day. Cause I'm like, this can't be the end. This, this is not how I go down. Like this is not how it works. Like I will not do this. Uh, and so I came home one night and just frustrated and like sick to my stomach because the weekend wasn't even uh, recovery. You know, the weekend was worse because now there's nothing to do and you can't do anything and then you just go back to the same hell on Monday and it's worse. So because we were transitioning to this new software and then so more files were coming in the new software and the old software so we're just getting worse. We couldn't go back. I mean, it was it was. Horrific. And uh, I just kept thinking to myself, it's not the end. It's, this isn't the end. This, is how it, this isn't how it ends. And as I was driving home one night, I thought, I got to do something. I, something's got to change. I don't know what I'm going to do differently, but something's got to change. And how many of you have watched Seinfeld? You guys watch it? <laughs> okay. You remember the episode where George and Jerry are sitting in the cafe and he's like, I'm gonna do everything the opposite of what I do. Who remembers this one? Yeah. So like that popped into my head. And I'm like, nothing's working. I'm doing the opposite of what I'm doing. And I thought, what would I do tonight? What would I normally do tonight? I'm like, I'm just gonna do the opposite. And I thought, I'm just gonna come home. I'm gonna order pizza. I'm gonna watch a movie. I'm gonna watch movies all night. That's what I'm going to do. I never do this. I rarely watch TV. Like, I rarely watch it. And I'm like, I'm just going to watch movies. And so I told the kids, we're going to watch movies. And they're like, okay. And so the kids gathered around and we sat down and I pulled up iTunes and I was looking through the movies and I saw this documentary on mountain climbing. And I thought, I would never watch that. I'm going to watch that. <laughs> And my, and my oldest son, he was like, let's see, he was 15 at the time. He's like, Dad, this is not a movie. I go, yes, it is. And we are going to watch it. He's like, this, is, this sucks. Because he had canceled his plans to be home. Anyway, so we started watching this movie. And this movie was titled Maru. How many of you have seen it? So what Maru is, um, where's the, Maru is, let's see. This is it. So no one, this documentary is about them summoning this mountain. And to, to date, up, up to this point of this, of this uh, documentary, no one has ever summited this mountain. Because you have to go up what's called the shark fin, and which is 1,500 feet. And then it's uh, inverted. And so you're actually, this isn't, this makes Mount Everest look like a playground because you have to carry all your food and you have to be able to climb, like not just climb a mountain, but then rock climb and you have to do it all on your own. And if you run out of food, you have to come back. At Everest, you have Sherpas and they carry all your food and you make it up the mountain. So no one, that's to the point that no one has ever summited this. Well, so I'm watching this documentary and there's three guys, Conrad, Jimmy and Renan and Conrad's the lead, and they start going up. They decide that they're going to uh, summit Maru. And so this is in 2008. And so they get up there, and they get about, I think it's about 100 feet from the summit, and they just can't make it. Like, they don't have enough food, and they would die. So they come back down. And so disappointed, because that's the closest anybody has ever gotten. And this was Conrad's life goal is to do this because this was like the pinnacle of everything that he's ever been doing because he's he's like he's the most uh, renowned mountain climber in the world and he comes back um, 
And the guy from Russia, I think it is, tries to summon it, and he's really worried because he's like, oh, crap, he's going to get it, and I never got it. And, and the guy goes up and comes down. He calls him up and says, I couldn't make it. I got close, but I didn't make it. So he's very um, encouraged in this moment. He's like, I'm going to do this again. So he gets, and during this time, his two partners, Renan and, and uh, Jimmy, have both had uh, significant accidents. Renan got a concussion. In fact, his uh, um, artery, he lost um, blood to his brain for a while, and they thought that he might have a stroke if he goes up there. And, and he had to rehabilitate his whole uh, walking and all the stuff because of the accident that he had. And so five months before they go up, he's rehabilitating how to walk and how to do this, and he's training because he's been uh, bedridden for a while. So they finally get back together, and they go, and they start making plans to go up, and they come to one final decision before they decide to really try to summit this mountain this time, and, and this is the decision. That this time when they go up, that they're going to summit, that even if they get to the point where they run out of food, but they can summit, and they would die coming down, they're going to summit. And they're like, we're going to do this. And he's like, D don't go on this trip if you're not going to die, if you're not going to summit to die. Like, that's how we're going to do it. And so in 2012, they get back together, and they start climbing Maru. During that time, they had some adversities. They broke some equipment. They lost some other stuff. And yet, they knew that this time they would never have another time to do this. And they persevered at a level that they've never done before. And in fact, they climbed it and they summited in a faster time than what they had anticipated. And I'm watching this and I'm just crying because I'm like, I think I'm going to die before I summon my mouth. They're like, this is awful. <laughs> like, my story does not end like this one. Like, I am almost dead. And I watch it, and then I realize that in that moment that the only reason why I'm not finding answers to my problem is that I'm not willing to die for it. I'm not willing to, to give everything it takes to get to the top. And I'm watching it, and I'm just thinking, I'm going to die. The, I have to be willing to do it. So I come to work the next day, or Monday, and I'm just committed, and I'm just thinking, oh, I'm like, this is going to happen. Sorry, let me go back. So that, that's Friday. So Saturday, I wake up, and I'm like, I got to run. Like, and I thought, I usually run a pattern I've been running it for like eight years, the same trail. And as I get out to run, I'm like, I'm going to go. I'm not even going to run that. I'm going to run just a portion of that. I'm going to go this way. I'm doing the opposite. Like everything I'm doing opposite. I almost ran backwards. I'm so committed to this. Because <laughs> I'm like, I can't figure this shit out. I got to do it the opposite. And so I run the opposite way. And as I'm running, uh, a guy I know is out mowing his lawn. He's, but this is like two miles from my house. And uh, he's out mowing his lawn, and he stops me and starts talking. I'm like, oh, I do not want to stop. I do not want to talk to him. I got to run. I got to get stuff done. I'm like, the opposite. I will stop and talk to him. And I literally, I, like, I was just committed all weekend. So I stopped, and I talked to him. And I'm like, go ahead. Let's talk, because I know it's going to be an hour. And <laughs> let's just do this. He just, he'll just talk about crazy stuff. Like, seriously, like crazy stuff. And I'm like, I don't even like talking to this guy. So I start talking to him. And then he's like, how's life? How's things going? And, he, and then he asked me a question. He's like, uh, he's like, how's work? And I thought, I'm just going to say it's great. And I'm like, it's shitty right now. Awful. It's the worst it's ever been in my life. And like Spring knows when she calls me and says, how's it going? I'm like, it's great. Life's great. And this time, it's good. Yeah, I'm like, it's good. It's really good. I'm like, this is really shitty. My life is awful. How can you help me? And he's like, uh, I don't know if I want to ask the question. And I'm like, exactly. Anyway, so we're talking about it. He starts asking me questions, and then he jars a memory in my mind, a thought in my, in my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, I freaking know Sean Warren. I know that, name's mean, that name means nothing to you, but he's a neighbor of mine that at the time he worked for Domo, 
And he was the solely responsible for the cloud, Domo's cloud, which is the 15th largest cloud in the world. And I'm like, Sean Morin can fix my server problem. I do, he will know it. And I'm like, Dave, I got to go. And I just, he's like, OK. So I take off running. So I run, and I run past Sean Morin's house, because he's my neighbor. And I'm like, Sean, could you help me on this? And he goes, I'm like, yeah, I could totally do that. He goes, dude, who's ever can't, whoever can't figure this out, they're effing idiots. He's like, because this is so simple. We can figure this out. The next day, I meet with Sean, and he puts me in contact with the head people of Domo, like the people that are running that company in the uh, IT department. And I sit down with him, and we map out what our server is. And we, as we're mapping this out, the guy goes, oh, I can tell you a problem. And, here, and here's what he said. He's like, you have 1.6 RAM currently assigned per user. You need eight. He's like, that's why they can't freaking open up an email. And that's why if you got on it at night, it's super fast. He's like, dude, your server, who built that thing? I'm like, I'm going to kill them. I'm like, so I don't want to tell you who it is because I'm going to kill them. And I'm like, <laughs> he gets there. So we get there and we figure it out. We start figuring it out. But when we figure this out, we realize that it's still going to be like four weeks, five weeks before it happens. Because we got to order the parts. Nobody has it. It's that unique. So I'm sitting there at work one day, and I'm just like, I'm so still timid with all of this. Because I'm like, at this point, even though I feel good about it, I don't even know if it's going to work. Because nothing has worked. And I'm like, who knows? But at least this is a different hope. And it was different. It felt different, you know? And so anyway, I'm sitting at work one day, and I'm thinking, at this point, if this is solved, what would be the worst thing that could happen to me before we actually solve it and fix it? Like, what, would, what would be another crushing thing? You know, like, what would be awful? And I thought, let's see, what would be worse? I'm like, one of my business partners leaves because this and goes to a competitor. That would be the worst thing. Like, at this point, like, that would start to be, you know. Anyway. So I went to Sue Cragen, who works, who's one of my partners, and I just went to her. And I know that she was in a lot of pain because she's the one handling all the phone calls because she's the marketer. And when there's a complaint or whatever, she's kind of like fielding all these you know, situations. So I thought, man, if she were to leave and she were to go there like to go uh, work with a former employee of mine, like this would be awful. This would be the worst thing ever. And I thought, I have to resolve this. Because this is the only thing I fear right now. Like, I don't, this is like, this is just my biggest fear. And if I can't resolve my biggest fear, I'm never gonna climb this thing. So I walk into Sue's office and I said, You got a second? She's like, Yeah. And I just closed the door. I said, Do not respond to anything I'm telling you right now. I just wanna tell you something. And she goes, What's that? And I said, I'm okay if you wanna leave. And she goes, Well, I go, you you've been stressed out as much as I have been. I'm like, and I can see it in your face, and every day we're like crying. I'm like, if you want to leave, just leave. I don't want to hold you back, and I don't want to ruin anything for you. I said, I don't know. Like, to this point, I don't even know if this is going to fix it. It's a hope, but I don't even know if this is going to fix it. So if you right now you're getting, you know, you have thoughts, and you don't want to persevere this, I said, I want you to leave. And she goes, Why? I said, because I'm going to climb this effing mountain. I'm summoning it. And if I have any doubt of your loyalty or where you're at or how much time and energy you're going to put into this, I will not summit this effing thing. And I said, so if you're not willing to die with me to summit this, I want you to leave. And I said, don't answer it. But I'm serious. I want to answer tomorrow because I'm done. I am not going to fear another thing in my life about the situation ever. I don't care who leaves, but I just need one. I said, you're, my, you're the person. And so I laughed, and I went home, and I came home, and I told my wife what I did. And she's like, you are stupider than I ever thought you were. She's like, Sue is amazing. Why would you ever say that to her? I'm like, it's what I fear the most right now. I'm like, and I have to get rid of it. And I just can't have that in my mind. And she goes, 
okay. <laughs> and so the next day, uh, I go into work. And um, I get a text from Sue, and she says, have you looked at your journal yet? And I'm like, no. She's like, well, look at it. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> like, I'm so stressed. Like, looking at my journal is the last thing I'm going to do today. But it's sitting on my desk. And I uh, finally get to my office. I open up my journal, and I find there's a sticky in it, sticky note. And it says this. And I framed it. And it said, dear Louie, uh, if we die, we die. See you at the top. And I literally just cried. I just sat at my desk and just cried and cried and thought, fuck, this is going to work. I can do this now. I'm like, that is exactly what I said. I'm like, this is going to happen. I'm going to be able to do this because there's nothing more I fear than, than that at this point. Like, that was it. And three weeks later, it all solved. The server worked. The parts worked. It was exactly the problem. And I was just like, I, cu I couldn't believe that the only way that I got there was following the philosophy of George Costanza. <laughs> like, like, I think he should be our next life coach. Like, but I couldn't believe that because what was happening was this. I was acting out of fear in every way that I was responding to life. And when you're acting out of fear in every way that you're responding to life, you do not possess the energy to change the reality. Because fear, as Jen showed on that scale, was like the lowest one. Besides being dead, I think that was like the lowest one. So today you've mapped out a plan for next year. And I can tell you, obstacles are showing up. Why? Because it's the nature of this planet that that's how it works. When something tries to go to light, darkness shows up to even it out. Always. It never doesn't happen. It's a law. You can't progress to something higher and not be tested to getting to that level. You can't. You have to show and reprove that you're worthy of it. You were worthy of the thought. You were given the ability. Now you got to see if you can put them together and make it actually happen. And that's when that will appear in your life. And if you're not willing to die and to give up going to a movie on a Friday night in order to meet your goal, you're not willing to kill certain things in your life to achieve it, you never will. Because in fact, the word, did we say this already? Die, or decide, right? Side, the root word is to kill. Suicide, pesticide, homicide. Decide means kill all other options. So if you're not decided to summit or die, the greatest things in life will always just be right out of your grasp, just like this was. It was 100 feet. And all of the work and energy that they put in their entire life to get to 100 feet shy of the summit the first time, it's because, only because, they weren't willing to die the first time. Or they would have summited it in 2008. So, when you make goals and you make a plan, I always ask myself, because of this experience, am I willing to die for it? <coughs> like, really, am I willing to die for it? And what I mean by that, am I willing to kill other things in my life so this can happen? You have that life will? I can tell you right now, a balanced life, it's a lie. You can't. Something's got to give. You only have so much time. And everything you want will never be balanced, so it has to be a calculated decision. I'm going to not recreate as much Three, so I can build my career. Eight, that's how it works. And if you think you're going to get eight and this stay the same, you're lost. 
it's nice to look at and say, yeah, if I just do this and if I can remember these things and refocus on this and just not lose that focus, I can keep it from getting so low and you can keep the balance at a certain level, but it's impossible for you to gain an extraordinary uh, gain in one area of life and not lose it in another. It's how life balances out. So in making these decisions, you also, in closing today, you have to make these decisions of what am I willing to kill so that I can get this? What am I willing to cut off so that this can actually happen? And I can tell you right now, if you're not willing to give those things up, I don't care how long you sit there and put it in your subconscious mind, it needs work. It ain't showing up. Just what Jen said, you can't just sit there and think, I'm amazing, I'm amazing. I'm the best, I'm the best, and not do anything. You just, it's just, it ain't gonna happen. So decide today and make it calculated as opposed to arbitrary and not what you really wanted. Decide today what should be in my life and what should be less in my life and where should I moderate in certain areas of my life so that I can gain at a higher level in my life, which would really make me happy. Knowing that that's not gonna last, meaning the next year you can recreate a lot because this happened, then you can, it's gonna go, it's gonna go up and down, you know? And so knowing that you're, but this knowing is you're doing it in a, in a calculated way. You're not doing it by chance. You're doing it by choice. Like what Spring talked about, she chose to live. Like, so choose to which things should be less, pri uh, less of a priority in your life so that you can get what you really want, not just what's easy to get. Robert Frost said, that by taking the road less traveled, that is what made all the difference in his life. And I think that's what today is about, deciding to take a road less traveled, deciding to summit and to give up other things so that you can get what you really want, so that when you go to bed at night, you can rest at ease knowing that you're leaving a legacy for your children a legacy of honoring who you are so that they will honor themselves. Thank you for letting me be here today.